morning. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, so yeah, I've been doing this for a real long time, uh, usually longer than I care to admit. And I've done all sorts of cool stuff. I've worked for government, I've worked for startups, I've worked for enterprise companies. I've touched the code probably on the sites that all of you go to every day. But what I realized is all it means is I've been fixing other people's problems, really, for a really long time. And so this talk was somewhat born out of that. But on top of that, uh, there was another factor that really played into me talking about this. And that is the cloud really ruined everything. It did, it really did. Because we all got used to the whole mentality of um, destroy and rebuild, right? And that's fantastic. But it is vaguely familiar to an endowed reboot that we all talked about 20 years ago with Windows that we tried to get away from, right? The whole idea of servers being our kettle, everybody know the pets versus kettle analogy, right? Yes, good. So it's awesome, right? The kettle, the kettle analogy is great because you have a whole bunch of servers, a whole bunch of cows, and if one of them gets sick, you take it behind the barn, you shoot it, you buy a new cow. That's awesome. Except when you get a mad cow disease and uh, all your cows get sick and you don't know why, and then you're left with no cows, no farm, and a huge mortgage on both of them. So in order to prevent that, you actually need to understand why, why your cows are down right, at some point. You may shoot it afterwards, but at least you've got to figure out what the symptom is. So troubleshooting, as defined by Wikipedia, and we all trust Wikipedia, it's a form of problem solving, right? You try to solve the problem. And in my definition, uh, problem solving is an ability to fix things that you know absolutely nothing about. So why is that important? Uh, why should we even care about this? And mainly it's because the systems we work with become more and more complex every day, right? Uh, we're not really building enterprise yet, but we're really getting there in some ways. And those systems break, and they break in a really spectacular ways. And what's worse, they break in a way, in a spectacular ways, when you expect it the least. And what happens then, right? How many of you here have a luxury not to have every one of your mess ups to be instantly seen by half a world? Like in other words, who doesn't work with web? Oh, there's one guy like in the back who is lucky enough not to have that. For the rest of us, any mistake that we make is made available to hundreds, thousands, millions of people, it depends on what you work with. And those people are generally not happy. And probably most importantly is, I know some of you may think that your job is to write the cool software, whatever it be, but in reality, your job is to fix code, whether it's somebody else's code or code of you who wrote it a week ago, which is more likely. More likely than not, you try to fix what's broken, right? You try to keep the stability. So I wanna make one quick disclaimer before we go forward. When I mean troubleshooting, I don't actually mean picking up a ticket from a backlog, just going and fixing it and pushing it to production. I know we all wish like, to get a bug and sit there with a latte in the middle of the afternoon trying to figure out why the page was a little slower than usual. In reality, when I talk about troubleshooting, which means everything is on fire, it's three in the morning, you're on fire, and the water buckets are full of gasoline, right? I'm talking about that kind of troubleshooting. So when you're in that situation, where do you begin, right? What is the first step you do when there is that problem, you get woken up by a page or by an angry customer, which is even worse, where do you start? And ironically enough, you start with replicating the problem. And I know a lot of people miss that part, but replicating the problem is really, really important. <laughs> because the input that you get about the problem is not necessarily the right one. You cannot imagine how many times I had a conversation, like after reviewing the code on push, and I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, oh, this doesn't make any sense, right? I'm looking at the code, and I'm looking at the problem description, and like, there is no way they should fix this problem. Like, there is no way they should fix any problem, really. So I go talk to a developer, I was like, hey, um, are you sure this fixes the problem? He's like, absolutely. I was like, how do you know? I was like, well, it runs after this. I was like, did, did, did it run before? He's like, what do you mean? Let's talk. Uh, so once you actually, <laughs> well, you should actually identify the problem, you need to isolate the problem, right? Because I mentioned that the systems are really complex, right? There's a lot of components to them. 
there is a lot of moving parts, and you need to figure out where the part, which part is broken. And it's not necessarily the part that warns you about, right? It's not even part of the error out or send the page. It may be something completely different. So let me give you an example. By the way, all the examples I use here, no matter how ridiculous they sound, are real examples that happened to me. So keep that in mind. <laughs> so this is an actual email I got from a customer as a bug report. It said, logins aren't working 100% of the time. Alerts are going off periodically. And to do it, the system didn't send out the scheduled emails. Right, pretty common or something along these lines. So as an engineer, like we parse it down to information that's important to us, which is logins are working and the system didn't send the scheduled emails, right? So immediately you get this email, you validate that it is indeed a problem, you, you, you get transient errors, and you go look into a login system, you look at the SSO, you look at the email schedule, and you try to figure out what's wrong with this. Problem with that is you're looking at the wrong part, part of the statement. The part they should be looking at are working 100% periodically today, right? Which indicates that the problem is not really in the systems that customer noticed, but right that there's a transient error somewhere that breaks different parts of the system periodically, right? In this particular case, for example, one of the nodes uh, was out of this space. So whenever the processes would hit that node, obviously they won't work, and that's why it would happen periodically. But if you don't think about it that way, if you don't parse that out to really get to the root of the problem, you're going to be going down the rabbit hole and trying to fix SSO when there's nothing wrong with it, really. And yeah, so once you get through all that, the third step, of course, is to fix the problem, right? That's, well, if it was, it would be the shortest talk ever. Because at that point, even when you isolated the problem, even when you identified the problem, you're still left with a simple question, right? You know what's the problem, you know it's broken, right? You confirm that it's broken, but you still don't know why. So you need to really understand what is broken. And actually, for the next probably few minutes, 10 minutes, I'll be talking about this word, understanding. Because you really need to understand a lot of things when you're trying to troubleshoot the systems. Right. So the first thing, as we talked about, would be understanding the actual problem. Right. And I can't stress enough how important it is to understand the problem you're trying to solve before trying to solve it. So, so many times I hear something along these lines, right? We can't support 100 requests a minute, we need to scale better. Sounds reasonable. I mean, yes, it should solve the problem, except for 100 requests a minute means less than two requests a second. If you can't serve less than two requests a second, you don't need to scale, you need to improve performance. Those of you who don't know the difference between scale and performance, see me after this talk. Because if you try to scale it, right, you, you're, you're throwing money at the problem, like literally throwing money at the problem without really fixing it. For the more visual of you, let's look at this graph. There is a problem there somewhere. Anybody can point that out? So, obviously, right? <laughs> somebody pushed the code, somebody did something that skyrocketed like uh, the latency on a lot of times. Except this is not the problem. Right, if you look at the numbers, maybe they're too small. Uh, the performance decree, uh, degraded from about 200 milliseconds to 600 milliseconds, which is 200% decrease, so it's pretty bad. But 600 milliseconds is still pretty reasonable, right? So it may be an acceptable risk. This is the actual problem, right? The performance continued to degrade over time, which got to over a second at some point which means if it hasn't been thrown timeouts to users at this point, it will at some point, all right? So what you actually need to fix is not the code that actually increased the performance perhaps because that may have been a viable change, but the problem that keeps it growing and growing and growing because that will affect, uh, at the end of it, affect the business itself, right? It will affect the users, it will affect the user experience. Which brings me to my second point that you need to understand. You need to understand the business. I have this quote that I've heard uh, by a customer of mine many years ago that was still by far the best quote I've ever heard. And I probably use it in most of my talks because it applies to literally everything. Business people don't care about technology at all. They care about technology supporting their business needs, right? So honestly, I can talk about understanding business for hours, but I wanted to use like the simplest example that everybody would be familiar with. 
404 error. Right, everybody had those, everybody suffered from those. Um, so what does that actually mean to you? I mean, we know it's page not found, right? Which means something broke, can't load the page, whatever it be. What does that actually mean to your business, right? So Amazon. If Amazon's homepage goes down, what does it mean to them, right? What does it affect the most? Anybody? Money, money, sales, right? I mean, the widget that uh, shows recommended products on Amazon generates like 27% of their revenue, which is ridiculous, right, considering how much money they're making. So if a homepage goes down, the first priority should be to bring out that widget, right? That is right there, generates the most revenue. But that's a simple example, right? Let's bring something a little more complicated. Uh, Wall Street Journal. If Wall Street Journal goes down, what is the effect? What is the main thing that they can do? Advertising. It is not content, right? Although they're a content company. It is the advertisement. It is the ad revenue. They serve uh, 32 ads on a homepage alone. 32. So you know what, if their homepage goes down, perhaps their first goal is not to show them the freshest content to the users, it is to bring up perhaps stale content, but with advertisement up, because every second they're losing money because visitors coming to the site. So whenever you try to troubleshoot, whenever you try to build something, wherever it be, but even in troubleshooting case, keep in mind that every technical decision powers some sort of business need, right? So you need to understand the need in order to come up with the best solution or even knowing what the solution should be or prioritizing the solution in order to meet that need. And which brings me to my third understandable point. We need to understand the impact, right? Every touch, time you touch something, uh, you need to understand the impact of the change. And again, the more complex the system are, the more difficult it is to understand what it's gonna impact every time. But talking about impact and prioritizing, you need to be able to to map the change you're trying to make to that business need, right? So, and sometimes that means breaking stuff. Like, it means legitimately breaking stuff. I had a situation, this is actually a graph. Uh, I had a situation where um, a company was getting hammered during the holidays, like completely hammered, unexpected levels of traffic, great promotion, I mean, great for the company, but the low times were ridiculously high, right? At some point it became unbearable, so people were dropping off, people, users were giving timeouts. Um, so if you have a performance problem that you can't fix, what do you do? You hide it, right? That's what caching was invented for. So I was trying, I was, decided, I was like, fine, we're gonna put like a level of caching in front of it, we're gonna hide the problem, we can deal with the latency, let's do it. Problem is that for one reason or another, the way they, they use the Apache traffic server as their front end proxy. But the way it was configured, it could not serve non-SSL pages properly. There were some rerouting rules. It was extremely complicated. And about 20%, no, probably less, about 12% of the website uh, was not in cell. So effectively, I couldn't put it behind the cache just like that. But you know what? I put it behind the cache anyways because I was willing to break 12% of the site in order for the other part to work and actually serve customers properly, right? because time is literally money. So I used to have a big projects where I would run the query to show how much money the company makes every minute to show the developers what would the downtime cost every time they break something, which is an awful way to learn, but at least it gives you an actual perspective, right? It's not a theoretical, oh, we're gonna lose that money. It is physical money that you're losing every time the page is down. And the funny thing is marketers and business people knew this way before us, right? The 80% now is better than 100% tomorrow. Who heard that mantra before for marketers? Just a few people, surprising. But what it actually means is usually marketers are willing to push something today knowing well that it will break for 20% of the users and then incrementally fix it by tomorrow to be 100%. And the reason for that is because this way they get 80% of revenue today and 100% tomorrow versus fixing it until tomorrow and only get an 100% of revenue tomorrow, right? It's, it's a numbers game, which is very difficult for a lot of developers, for a lot of apps to understand. And what, I'm, what I just said is incremental improvements, right? It's one of the other keys to troubleshooting and to fixing problems, right? It's, it is not black and white. 
More often than not, there is like a lot of shades of gray in between, between things being broken and things working optimally, right? I mean, if you look at an animated problem, this looks like a pretty standard curve for when something goes wrong, right? You have a norm, right? You have a standard uh, threshold for something, which works great. Then something happens, whether you push something to production that you shouldn't, or more people come to the site, or there is a marketing campaign, and then you have a problem, right? And then you get page in the middle of the night, you start working on this, you fix the problem, everything gets back to normal. What a lot of people forget, I guess, because it's pretty common knowledge, is that an acceptable threshold, which is much higher than the norm usually, right? So going back to the example that I gave, 200 milliseconds is a fantastic low times, right? But is 400 milliseconds acceptable for a short period of time, or 600? The answer is probably yes, right? As long as it doesn't majorly impact the user experience, it's probably acceptable. So in this particular example, there was four different fixes that went into production before it actually got to norm. But after first fix, the user experience got to acceptable level and the business was still operating as usual. All right, so consider this. It doesn't have to be all or nothing, right? If you have even a short-term fix or incremental fix, do it, right? That's why we talk about continuous deployment all the time, right? So you could push small incremental changes. All right, so what have we learned so far, right? Uh, we need to understand what's important. We need to understand cause and effect. Uh, and as such, we need to understand what impacts the business mostly and prioritize it based on that. And we need to take acceptable risk once in a while, right? We always gotta assess the risk between pushing to production, between making the change or whatever it be. So that's all great. And now let's talk something a little more fun. Now let's talk about what not to do when you're troubleshooting. Um, which is going to be significant or more ranty than it was worth before. So first of all, like I said, don't assume, right? Don't, I mentioned it before, and I'll probably mention it again in the next few minutes. Don't assume you know what the problem is and you know what the solution is, right? Correlation does not call causation, right? If you want to prevent people from drowning, don't try to stop Nicolas Cage from making movies. By the way, that's a fantastic website if you want to go there and check it out. They've got a lot of awesome stuff. But yeah, correlation does not necessarily cause causation. So think, like, think about what you're actually trying to solve. Funny enough, don't trust the errors. Errors were written by humans, and humans are faulty. I had a situation which is funny. I got a call from my bank saying, there is something wrong with your account, please come in. I was like, okay. So I come into the bank, and a really nice gentleman said, oh, there is a problem with your birth date. I was like, that's funny. I'm pretty sure I haven't changed it in at least 40 years. Um, I was like, okay. And he goes in the system, he logs in, he looks at my profile, goes, oh, I see it. Uh, your birthday doesn't match the one on the credit score. And I'm like, again, that is really weird because I'm pretty sure I haven't changed that. And he keeps on looking for another five minutes. So I was like, oh, I see what the problem is. We don't have your birthday on file. So as a developer for many years who wrote a lot of crappy code, I understand how no does not equal something. It really doesn't match. But it doesn't solve my problem, right? It didn't give me the right information in order to give a proper answer. So don't trust the code. I mean, don't. <laughs> On the same token, uh, we were talking about humans a little bit. Uh, troubleshooting is a stressful time. And it doesn't necessarily bring out the best in people, to say the least. There is a couple, of, like when you troubleshoot, especially when you troubleshoot with people, there's always one or two, hopefully none, but there usually is one or two people who tend to complain more than they try to fix something. And there is a couple of excellent, excellent excuses that people give while trying to troubleshoot. This would be one of my favorite. It's not documented. You know what? At three in the morning when everything is on fire, I really don't care. You know what you should do? You should create a ticket, assign it to yourself, and work on it first thing in the morning to document this. At this point, read the damn code. Even better, I didn't build it. It's like, again, I don't care. Like, I don't care who built it at this point, I just care who's gonna fix it at this point. It tests all the tests. How many people heard people say that? 
Literally, everything is broken, and the answer is like, oh, I don't know why it's broken. Pass all the tests. Well, I got bad news for you. Perhaps you should revisit your test suite. <laughs> and by far, by far, my favorite one is everything looks right. It's like, you know what? Clearly it's not. I mean, it, it is the same as like it works on my laptop. Uh, but generally, that answer comes in from the fact that people give up quickly, right? People go in, they look at something, they check the logs, they load the web page, they like, oh, everything works. I don't know what's wrong with it. Oh, the pages are blown up, like the graph shows all things, but everything looks fine, right? Everything's fine. So don't stop troubleshooting even if something like comes up naturally. And on the same token, conversely, don't cling to the mistake because you spend a lot of time making it, right? A lot of people tend to like be very protective of their own code, for example. So if you spend time on a the code, they push that out and it broke horribly, they will go out of the way to try to prove that it's not their code that's broken, which is awful because you're wasting cycles, you're wasting time, and in the meantime, the whole business is down, right? On the flip side of this, people, try, people think they have a solution and they work on it, and despite being proven like over time that that might not be the solution, they're very hesitant to just drop it and go in a different direction. So don't be afraid to change directions there. Like, you're there to solve the problem and not to feed the ego. Right, that's the whole goal, like you're there to solve the problem. You can argue about it, you can argue the documentation, whose fault it is, have a post-mortem, have a retrospective. Three in the morning is not the time to do this. And one thing that people always forget is don't be a hero, right? It's a team sport, um, ask for help, right? If you're out of your element or you think you need a second pair of eyes, that's always great, ask for help. General people are very receptive to that kind of thing. All right, so um, one last thing that I want to talk about a little bit is tools. And I'm not going to talk about particular products or whatever it be. I just rather want to talk about the types of tools that you should be familiar with that would generally help with the troubleshooting. And there are three of them. Logging, monitoring, profiling, which can probably be all wrapped in under the term observability. Uh, so logging. Uh, logging should be actionable, it should be concise, and should be parsable, right? And um, who's familiar with the log levels? Awesome. Who have them implemented in production right now, like those log levels? Oh, less people, but still. Stop doing that. <laughs> the only <laughs> levels that you shouldn't print in production are error and fatal. And there's a couple of reasons for that, right? First reason, of course, is readability. When you need to go through the logs, like not the machine reading of the logs, but you actually need to go through the logs, you need to be able to find the information you're looking for quickly. So as an example, this is a log entry for a single request for one of the process runners. And it's fantastic, like it is awesome. It has the UIDs, it has all the data that we're getting, it had like every step completed and whatnot, it has a timing, I mean, it's great. Right. If I read through it, I'll get a full picture, I'll make sure every step completed properly, that's fantastic. Except for when I'm troubleshooting something, when I'm trying to find a root cause, this is all I care about. Right? I care about the idea, I care about error. Everything else I can pull from other places. So it's much easier to digest and find that information. Right? Shader logs are not really easy to parse and read. And another thing that a lot of people don't think about, verbosity is expensive. Right? Logs are expensive. Like, that log, that little snippet of code is 2K. Like, I mean, do the math. 100 requests a second, 60 seconds over two web servers, let's say, if not seven web servers. Like, you're aggregating mags and mags and mags and mags of logs a minute. So don't do that. Be selective with your logs. Make sure that you can extract the information that you need when you need it. Unlike monitoring, you should monitor everything. You really should collect data on everything. And by everything, I mean business, I mean marketing, I mean systems, I mean APM. Anything you can imagine, you should collect information on. And I'm a huge, huge uh, proponent of business-first monitoring, where the most important things are business-related, and everything should be supported in that. And as such, you need to be able to correlate it back to it. So again, I'll give you an example. Um, I had a customer call, and uh, always starts with a call, right? And uh, tell me, we have a problem. I was like, okay, what's the problem is? And he was like, well, our revenue's down. 
He's like, okay. It's like something wrong with the system. I'm like, all right, let's take a look. So I look at the graph, and luckily we had a metric for revenue. So yeah, I mean, if you look at the graph, there is clearly a dip in the revenue. So I looked through this, and I was like, all right, let's take a look at if there's anything wrong with the system. So we'll look at the user performance, right? Maybe there's a latency, like users can't check out, whatever else be. It looks pretty normal. We go through a couple other things. Database is generally a performance factor. We'll look at the database. Again, it's pretty normal, everything. And again, those are just a few. Like you go through tens and tens and dozens of different metrics trying to figure out if anything wrong. Everything looks fine. And I forgot to say, the company itself is a marketing company, right? They've been doing like, a, they had online entertainment, they, has, they had about 100 million users and send about 70 email, uh, million emails a day, right? Because they're a marketing company, they have different campaigns, they have splits, all that stuff. So we keep on going down the chain and everything looks fine. And at some point I'm like, maybe you should talk to your salespeople. I mean, really, like revenue is down, everything seems to be in order. But we continue digging a little more, and finally we got to the email metrics, which were also locally collected. And apparently, one of the major ESP providers uh, accidentally blacklisted them. Yahoo, or forget, or AOL, however it was. Which means less people got the email, less people clicked on the link, less people looked, went to the website, less people bought stuff, less revenue. Right. So remember how I said correlation does not cause causation? Don't, don't underestimate the correlation. Like, make sure you can, you collect, we had a whole conversation yesterday in open spaces about it yesterday. Make sure you're able to correlate the business metrics, the ones that are important, to the metrics that you collect that support it, like system metrics, user metrics, performance metrics. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about profiling. And profiling is when you have the what, but you still have no idea why it's broken, right? You, you know what's broken, you know where it's broken, but you still have no idea why. And that would be any tool, uh, there is a number of tools obviously. There is, it's your PR sets and tops, that's your val grind, cache grinds. There is a number of different profile tools that you'll use, dtrace, strace, right? Uh, so give you another example, the last one. Um, had a situation where the servers were running out of CPU really quick, like the cycles were spinning, it was really, really bad. And just look at the distribution, it's clear it was Apache. Right, Apache was hitting on the CPU. Problem is, I had no idea what process, right? I had no idea whether it's a particular page, particular process, what was it? So a colleague of mine whipped out a quick dtrace script. They gave me this list. It basically parsed out all the requests and gave me CPU consumption per URL, which is amazing, right? It's awesome, because looking at this, like there's clearly the get all requests, get all the CPUs significantly, right, by a factor of 10, if not 100 over normal pages. I mean, fantastic may be a wrong word, but like, I was excited that I'd be able to get, I was able to get this information, because with this information, I can go and go through a code and try to troubleshoot that particular page, right, and create an immediate help. The other problem is once you get this information, you go down the rabbit hole and then you have to troubleshoot the page, but, you know, that's a different problem. All right, so troubleshooting is a required skill, right? I think we'll all agree on this. I think, I hope we'll all agree on this because otherwise we're in trouble. Uh, it is educational. You learn a lot of things as you troubleshoot systems, a lot. Um, make sure that it's iterative, right? You can't fix everything at the same time, but you can make continuous improvements to the system. It is extremely frustrating. Every time you have to troubleshoot something like this, any of the examples, it is annoying. But uh, it is also extremely rewarding, right? Because hopefully rewarding because at the end of it you can say, hey, I solved the problem in a real creative way. All right, that is all for me. Hopefully it was helpful. Thank you. I'm really intrigued by that CPU per URL example. Can you talk a little more about that? Uh, I can. It's a dtrace script that basically attaches to the probe. We were running it on uh, Illumos based systems. So it had a full dtrace support. So it, it connect, it actually has a code on the slides. So I'll publish the slides and it's got a GitHub link. Uh, it attaches to, it basically a little script that attaches to the HTTP processes. It pulls out all the information. They can process it out and show it in a digestible format. 
It's real simple, actually. It's pretty awesome. Are there such things as design patterns for debugging? So things that might be common from case to case to case that you find you can reuse? Uh, I guess the short answer is no, because you never know what the problem is. Uh, I think there are best practices, right, what to do, some of the things that I talked about. Um, yeah, I mean, general things I just talked about basically validate, uh, replicate, uh, isolate, and then try to fix it. And when, when you get to the part of trying to fix it, it's gonna be different every time, right? Because it's troubleshooter. You can never estimate it, you can never predict it, you don't know what it's gonna be, right? Up to, that, up to the point where, like I said, up to the point where I knew it's a CPU problem, it was all, like, you can outline what needs to be done, right? Once we get to the point where a CPU problem coming from Apache, then it was anybody's game, right? Because you gotta dip much deeper to figure out what it is. You were um, mentioning to not give up mm -hmm. when you're troubleshooting, and I wonder, when is a good time to give up and say, oh, well, we have the next version coming, or this might be fixed in a week? Do you uh, look at the business, or do you look at the software? So uh, those are actually two different questions, right? Uh, questions whether you, you can look at it in a week or you can look at it in the morning uh, should be asked regardless, right? Because uh, there is a whole conversation about alerting versus monitoring, right? So you never, you should never alert on something that you don't have an actionable response for immediately, right? Because if you're woken up in the middle of the night and you can't do anything about it, why did you get woken up in the middle of the night? Uh, question is whether you can fix later or whether you can pass it on to somebody. Uh, generally, it's a business decision, right? So you go in and if something is completely broken, you have to come up with a solution. What that solution would be is dependent on your business needs, right? So if your media site, for example, right, what, what I talked about, uh, is showing stale content acceptable solution in the short term, right? Well, it fixes something else. And maybe the answer is yes, right? Then you bring up the older content somehow and then try to figure out what's wrong with it. Maybe the answer is no. If the answer is no, then again, you try to fix it as soon as possible, but when you realize it's gonna take, let's say, hours, if not days, then you go back to the business and say, you don't have an option, right? So here's the options B, C, and D that you can choose from. There is no more A kind of thing. Yeah, so it's case by case, but it does based on the business, right? It does based on the business. And like I said, sometimes fixing is breaking, right? Sometimes you need to break something or disable portion of the functionality, which is actually really common, right? It's particular piece of functionality breaks everything. It's, at least in my experience, it was very common to just turn it off, right? And that functionality can be critical sometimes, like it could be ads. It can be like CTAs on the page to show you all the immediate content, right? Uh, it can be login, right? So many sites nowadays, even when they do maintenance, they turn off anything right related, like logins. So it depends on the situation, but it should come from the business side of things. Thank yeah, you. so the question is, is when do you make a decision what's acceptable risk and what's acceptable norm uh, by the, when you're troubleshooting? So when do you decide that you incremental improved it enough that it's acceptable versus getting back to the base uh, optimized line. Uh, it actually, again, goes back to the previous question. It, ba it, it is based on business, right? It is a business acceptable risk and whatnot. Um, yeah, uh, so ideally, you have those defined before that. Ideally, you understand business enough, enough to either make that determination or have somebody from business to make that determination for you. Basically, I'll lay out the options and saying, hey, we brought it down to an acceptable level. Like, page doesn't time out for your customers anymore. It does a little, a little slow. Some images don't load, for example, but it does load for your customers, right? We now brought it to stable state. Uh, to get it to 100% stable state because of X, Y, and Z, it will take us probably 24 hours. Uh, I need my people to go to sleep now because otherwise it's gonna be 48 hours because nobody works better without sleep uh, and present those arguments. Ideally though, you have enough information about the business uh, to make a lot of those decisions. I mean, obviously not all of them. So like you can make a decision what's more impactful turning off ads or turning off content unless you know it, right? So some of those decisions have to be made by business. But some of the decisions may be purely technical, right? I mean, if you see database load or CPU load at 80%, right, it's probably wrong. If you can get it down to like 65-ish, eh, do you think you can survive till the morning? Like technically, 
right? And if the answer is yes, you can call it a night, get some sleep, and try to fix it in the morning, that kind of thing. So in that example, when I showed the CPU stuff, right, if I fix the biggest offender, which was like a factor of 100 over the norm, right, if I fix that, would it bring down the CPU consumption to a level where it might not be the best, right? It might not be what it was before, but it would be to the level where the pages would not time out or not take 12 seconds to load. And if that's the answer is yes, then I was like, fine. I can go through the rest of the pages and optimize them tomorrow, the next week, whenever over the next week, I get them done. So it depends what the problem was. Uh, my, my question is this, you've done a really great job about talking about troubleshooting as an individual, things that can contribute to uh, an individual being more efficient, more effective, uh, ways to do logging that would make it easy for an individual. Can you speak a little bit about what you can, what can be done around team troubleshooting? Because sometimes you get in a room with a bunch of other people, what are effective things you can do as a team to improve your uh, troubleshooting? So actually, the same, con uh, uh, same concepts apply, actually, when you work with a team, like as long as you don't whine, like I talked about. Uh, generally, when I troubleshoot with the team, I try to distribute the, the areas of search, right? So if we have different skill sets, right? It also depends on the skill sets of the team, right? So if I troubleshoot, I have development background, so I'm, I'm mostly comfortable troubleshooting top to bottom, not bottom to top. So if I'm upper, working with somebody from operation side or heavy operation side, I'll have them research the CPU stuff where I'll look at the code. If I'm working with somebody with the same similar skill set or a group of people similar skill set, I will try to distribute the areas. So saying, I think we have a problem, potential vectors of problem in these three areas. Let's investigate our own, but continuously communicate, right? Chat, sit in the same room, whatever that be. Uh, continuously communicate because Every time somebody finds something, it may impact what other people are doing. So that continuous communication really helps. I mean, r ridiculously helps, actually. Because when you see this and somebody said, hey, I did something that didn't impact you, and you look at it and you see, oh, it just improved by 20%. It's like, I, I'm not really sure what you did, but thank you, like, kind of thing. So yeah, I mean, it's pretty standard things, like nothing extraordinary that I can recommend. You just talk to each other, be nice to each other. Awesome. Leon, thanks so much. This is great. <laughs>